and action. Welcome back to Show and Tell. My name is Billy. I live in New York City on the ninth floor of a high rise apartment building and I don't stash. I feel like this is a 12 step program or something. I'm identifying myself and my habit. Yeah, I have a big knitting habit and I knit every single day. Don't you? I think you probably do. Otherwise, you might not be watching this podcast. Behind me, you can see two of my recently finished projects. This one's been mostly finished for quite a while, but at Rhinebeck a couple weekends ago, I acquired these vintage buttons. So I, I wanted to get the buttons on. I wanted to show you how I might style it with a piece of vintage jewelry. It's a it's a beautiful marcasite initial pin, not my initials, obviously. And then this one, the Carol Feller Dacite. And if you didn't see my Rhinebeck episode, you should go back and watch it because I was so excited to tell you that I met Carol Feller. I just happened to walk into a booth where they were selling yarn and there she was and I kind of recognized her. So that was kind of fun. This brooch is another vintage brooch and Hiding underneath here, you can see the vintage buttons for this that I acquired at Rhinebeck. Let me give you a close-up view. See, they're, they're not really iridescent, but it just depends on how the light hits them. So that's that one. And Here's a close up of this one, the button and this vintage brooch. Uh, if you haven't seen these before, this is a 1940s jacket. There are many parts to it. There was the collar and the collar was folded in half and then attached. The shoulder seam is up here. It's not a continuous piece that wraps around, but the front panel, you change color at this place. So you knit, you knit with the opposite color here and then stitch the shoulder together. Um, the lapels were interesting. I hadn't done that before. Maybe I should take this down again. Um, the lapels were also interesting because you didn't just knit up the front. You had to, at, at some point, start increasing and also make this little notch up here that would fit together with the collar. It was very unusual construction. And as you can see, there's a little bit of facing that goes all the way down the edge on both sides. It's very, very nicely finished. There's also a hem at the bottom. And uh, it doesn't call for mitering the corner, so I didn't. But you can see that's the... Um, Let's see, how can I better show this? So when you get to the bottom, you have that little bit of facing and down the front edge, both edges, and then you have a hem that goes all the way around. There are also slits in the side to accommodate a belt. I haven't knit the belt yet. I hope to someday, and I do have extra buttons, so I could make, I could jerry rig some kind of a buckle. Um, there is a second patch pocket. I haven't, I haven't put it on yet. 
One of these days I'll get to it. This was a work in progress for quite a long time. It wasn't just the number of pieces and the interesting stitch on the, the arms and the back. This was some kind of like a twisted rib. It, it was a lot of knitting. I think there were over 100,000 stitches. I don't remember, I'll have to put on the screen the size needle. It might've been on a size two needle. It was a lot of yarn. The yarn I used was Sandus Garn Sisu. I'm pretty sure I'll put that on the screen as well because I started it so, so, so long ago. And it's been sitting in a bag for years waiting for buttons. And finally at Rhinebeck this time, I got the button. So yay. So what am I presently working on? I'm about to tell you. This has been folded up in my project bag for a little while. It's the Hollyhock Wrap by Pearl Soho, a free pattern on their website done in their linen quill, not the yarn that's called for, but they assured me that this yarn would be workable for this project. So. I wanted to see what everybody's buzzing about with linen quill and I opted for this. It comes in so many colors and I thought this is always going to go with my gray wardrobe of which you might have seen a past episode. I showed you a bunch of gray sweaters. Um, this is a little bit hard to continue to work on. So even though I set out to be a monogamous knitter on this, I failed. This herringbone stitch is done on both the front and the back, and it's a little tedious, monotonous, I guess is the better word, because you're passing one stitch over two other stitches constantly all the way across the row, and then you turn around and you do it on the back. Yes, on one side you're knitting some of the stitches, on the other side you're purling some of the stitches, but it's kind of it's boring. It doesn't go quickly. With stockinette, I can fly across the row. This, you know, every stitch kind of has to be manipulated and rue the day that you might drop something because it disappears behind other things. If you're a master knitter, I would love for you to comment and tell me how you try and find those stitches. It's really, really hard. And there's no pearl row to put a lifeline into. Um, I guess you could put a lifeline and pull back to this. I don't know. It's really, really like a, it's kind of a complicated thing. It looks like it should be simple because you're doing the same thing over and over again. But my main gripe is that it's a little monotonous. So I kind of force myself every couple of days to pull it out and work on it for a few hours so it doesn't get neglected. Um, <clears throat> it is knit with two skeins held together. So when I finish these two skeins, I know that I'm halfway through the project. That will be very exciting. This is one of those patterns where you knit halfway and then you start at the beginning of the other half and knit all the way up and then graph the two of them together in the center. Same situation for my lace scarf, which has been put aside, the Ibiza lace, that short, the chartreuse scarf, if you remember seeing that. Anyway, this doesn't seem like that much. So I know that I'll be getting to the halfway mark in the not too distant future. And what can I say? Stay tuned for more about that. Eventually, before the winter is through, I hope that this will be complete. My next work in progress is what I've called the swizzle stick. It's a pattern from the 1930s. I'll insert a picture here so you get an idea of what's going on.
Kilroy was here. Uh, this is the front. I'm partway up the front. You can see the lace pattern. You might remember that I tried doing this with the chenille yarn and it was just warming out and giving me a big headache. But with this yarn, which is 100% mohair from Underhill Farm in Pennsylvania, this yarn is dreamy, just soft and cuddly. And there's quite a bit of um, volume to it. I don't know if that's the yarn or if it's this particular stitch, which makes it a little puffier, but it's dreamy to work with. And again, with this pattern, I would say the same thing as the hollyhock wrap, that there's a lot of passing slip stitches over, hard to find an error. In this one, there are relief pearl rows. So I did put a lifeline in recently in case I need to pull back, which I have done one time. If you haven't knit lace, you might be wondering about all these stitch markers. This pattern is a six stitch repeat. So I have put a stitch marker every six stitches so that if I ever notice that I have five stitches or seven stitches in between the markers, then I know that I've got an error somewhere and I can fix it before I move on. It's super helpful. And I think just about everyone who knits lace will tell you it's essential to do that. Um, the reason I have it on a cord right now, I slipped it off, is because I got a little tired of doing this and I wanted to use my needle to move on to another part of the sweater. This vintage pattern, similarly to this, has parts. It has a collar. It has a waistband. It has two sleeves and it has a front and a back. So... I had already knit one of the sleeves. I'm also playing yarn chicken a little bit. I have a limited amount of this. My friend Susie bought me two beautiful skeins of this color. Um, I forget the yardage, but it's not enough to do the whole sweater. That I know. She did buy me a third skein, which might have made it through the sweater. I'm not even sure. But it's an ivory color. And it wasn't a contrasting color that I wanted to do this sweater with. Um, you, I'll put a picture here of my inspiration for the color scheme. The Pierce Arrow Art Deco poster that I showed. But I'll show it to you again. Um, Anyway, at Rhinebeck, I picked up another type of mohair. This is a blend. It's um, kid silk mohair, and I forget. I'll put it on the screen. Um, so it's a different makeup than this, and it's also finer, to give you an example. So I'm holding this double. I've had some good practice recently winding my own cakes of yarn. For those who are new, um, you should know that because I live in a small apartment, I don't have a Swift, I don't have a ball winder. I'm not really interested in having those things because when I need to, I can do this by hand. So this has a lot of yardage. I think this is close to 500 yards. So right now I'm pulling from the center and pulling from the outside at the same time. And I bought a second skein of this. So I have plenty of this, which means I might do the whole back of the sweater in this color, but I'm doing it in parts, you know, piece by piece to make sure, like once I finish the front, I'll have a better idea of whether I have enough to do the entire back in this lighter color. I don't think that I will. So, that's one of the good things about working in pieces and doing patterns that are two tones because it gives you more options. 
anyway, um, I'm really enjoying this project because there are th these different parts. Oh, what I haven't shown you, oops. The part that I'm working on presently is the waistband. And right now it's about 25 inches long. My waist is not 25 inches, so I still have some knitting to do, but you can see that it's in these parallelogram shapes and they're not the same size. They, they vary in width. I believe this will be the front and the rest of it will wrap around and need it. Um, the pattern actually calls for this to be tied in the back of the waist. I don't think I'm going to do that. I think it would make too much of a lump. I'd rather have the back be smoother, but this will get sewn on to the bottom of the front. So actually I hadn't thought about it till just now. I might be getting to the point of the front, even though it looks short, I might be getting to the point where I'm almost to the underarm because don't forget, I have this at the bottom of all of that. So I might be okay. I mean, I'm still gonna have to do the back. I'm thinking if I do the back of the sweater in this darker color, I might not wanna do it in that lace. Um, this is in one by one ribbing all the way. I might wanna do the back like that, or I might wanna do the back just plain stockinette and make it easy on myself. Cause these things, take a lot of time. I'm not on a particularly small needle. I'm on a size five needle, but still there's a lot of fussing with just about each stitch. So that's work in progress number two. Now let's talk about acquisitions. I usually don't have any but this particular week, I do have a couple things to share with you. At Rhinebeck, I ran into my friend, Margaret Hubert. She's, she knits and crochets, but she's more of a crochet specialist and she's written a variety of books. And she had books for sale at Rhinebeck, but she had run out of this little booklet. And she had this jacket hanging on the wall behind her and was telling me that it was made with doilies. Probably many of you have doilies from your great grandmother or your grandmother sitting in a drawer somewhere. They never get used. And I thought this was just a brilliant idea. So I ordered this little booklet from her because she had run out of them. And this arrived since I last spoke to you. If anyone is interested in purchasing this booklet, leave a comment in the notes and I'll try and get the information for you. I especially wanted it, not because I'm especially planning to make things with doilies because I don't have any of those actually, but I thought it would give me a good idea for the blouse that I want to make out of all the hankies that I have from my grandmother and my mother and from my own childhood. So I thought the technique that she used to make this might also apply to that. And when I read through the booklet, it seems like that will work for me. I'm not there yet. That's probably going to be a summer project, but I've mentioned it in the past. I have dozens and dozens of lovely Irish linen, some of them beautiful hand rolled edges with embroidery monograms and so forth. And I just thought they shouldn't be sitting in a drawer. Sometimes I use them as hankies, but there's so, so, so many that I thought it would be really interesting to put them together in a wearable kind of work of art. So that's one thing that I acquired. Just about a week ago, I joined a neighborhood knitting club. It's a new group. We're just assembling. And someone from the community donated a bunch of yarn to help us get started. Not that I needed yarn. And I know many of the other people 
probably have stash, but some of the knitters are newer knitters and they didn't have needles, they didn't have yarn. So it was nice of people to donate. Well, people sifted through this bag of goodies and nobody really wanted anything. Some of it was acrylic, but Billy over here, I came home with this. Some of the skeins needed a little bit of rewinding, which now I feel pretty accomplished at. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little on the messy side, but I just wanted to get them all balled up. How many are here, you ask? I think there's seven. One, two, no, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these. It's a yarn that I believe is from Germany, but it's made in Italy. It is called Soft Kid GGH GMBH. They are from Pinneberg. I guess that's a town in Germany. Um, they don't even have the number of yards. They only give meters. It's 25 grams. It's got all kinds of letters going on here, but it's 25 grams. And they say approximately 138 meters. Super Kid Mohair, 70%. 25% nylon and 5% new wool, virgin wool. It's soft like a cloud and it's single ply. I don't remember. I, I've never knit with anything like this before. You can see it has a lovely halo and it's just super cloud-like. I think it could probably be torn easily or felted easily. It just has that vibe to it. I'll see when I start to knit with it. Um, they say it gets 18 stitches and 25 rows to a 10 by 10 centimeter, or they don't use inches here at all, on a four to five needle. Now, I don't know if that's US four and five. They're not saying four and five millimeter. I'm gonna have to play around with it um, to see. I'm hoping that it's a US four, that would be groovy. Do I have something in mind for this? Yes, I do. I think I might wanna make a little cardigan, kind of like an evening wear cardigan called Rebel Rebel by Libby Johnson. I've had my eye on this pattern for a while because a woman who used to hang out pre-pandemic at Nitty City, hi, Barbara, if you're watching, she knit that sweater and I just thought it was lovely and she raved about it. She seemed to really enjoy knitting it. I'm thinking something three-quarter sleeve, very kind of, you know, elegant um, that you might wear over a camisole or something. And there is a yarn that I saw last year at Vogue Knitting Live that I'll look for when I go back in 2024 that has little sequins in it, like just a little touch of shimmery sequin. It comes in colors, but it also came in an ivory color. And I think maybe I would look at doing like trim on the cuffs and there are no buttons in that cardigan but maybe down the front and around the neckline to give it a little bit of a decorative edge. Um, I don't think that I have to play yarn chicken here. There's so much of this. Isn't it great? It's like having a bowl of cotton candy. By the way, the bowl is from my great grandmother, Fanny, who arrived in Philadelphia in, I think, about 1902. And evidently, a lot of this cut crystal came from the Philadelphia area because they have 
something in the earth, I don't know, silica, or there's a high concentration of some mineral that made it possible to carve this glass without it breaking. So I have quite a collection of this stuff I used to think was really ugly. I sort of still do, but it is utilitarian. I have a couple of other things to share with you that are not exactly knitting related, but hopefully of interest. From time to time, I get invitations to attend live or online events from Lake Hole, the jewelry school affiliated with the famous jewelers Van Cleef and Arpels. And they did a whole video on pearls recently. And because my mother's name was Pearl, I have more than a passing interest in pearls. So I'm going to leave a link in the show notes for this video. You can read all about how pearls are formed and the different types of pearls. It's very, very fascinating. But I particularly thought for my knitters, that many of you may have used mother of pearl buttons on some of your sweaters and you'll start to get an understanding of where mother of pearl comes from, how it's related to pearls. I just thought it was an interesting little thing to throw out there. Additionally, I found this interesting. There was an American baseball player named Jock Peterson who started wearing pearls and it caught on with some of his teammates and I think other baseball players and some men started to wear strands of pearls, which is, I thought, very interesting. And I'll leave a link to an article about him and shows him wearing his pearls. Okay, there's just one more thing. Um, oh yeah. Last week I was showing this brooch. I had it separated into its dress clips because I had worn these on the lapels of this jacket the day that I wore it to Rhinebeck. And I promised to come back and show you how, how this works. So Right now, this is all assembled on a base. So there are two dress clips, but turned into one brooch. I have something that's called a jeweler's loop. You may have seen jewelers use this. It's a magnifying glass, heavy duty magnifying glass. Ooh, the magnification is worn off. It might be 20 times. Anyway, I wanted to look through this to see. I believe that this has a patent. It does have a patent number on here. I had it upside down. Patent number. One seven nine eight eight six seven. It looks like and I think it says in script coro c o r o duet d u e t t e. I'll hold it up to the camera. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. Very tiny in here and very tiny under there. Anyway, why is it patented? Because it's so cool that if you lift this up, Let's see if I can do this. Um, if you lift that, this piece comes out of here. And similarly, you can go on the other side and lift that. 
and it comes out. So this is the base that everything clamps into. But if you unassemble it, then you have these, which have some serious prongs on it. You wouldn't want this to come in contact with your finger. It's not an earring, although it looks like it would be a clip-on earring. It would be a great clip-on earring, but it's not meant for that. It's meant to clip onto a piece of fabric. Like that. And I believe it's kind of rare to find both of them. Sometimes women lost one and it messed up the pair. Not only rare to find a pair, but to have it fit into, you know, to still have this piece. And also when they're in here, the fact that they meet in the center, they meet very nicely in the center and they're not really wobbly. You know, they're, they're in there. So I have not just one of these, but I was able to find a second one. This is a different mechanism, different system. I don't see anything on here about it being patented. This works like so. These just pull off, just slides off. And the other side just slides off. Maybe. Here it goes. So similar thing with these cookie clamp things in there that will grab on, that will grab onto fabric. And these go together very well also. So you can wear it as a brooch or separately. I love these. I have a necklace with the same motif. I found them different times, luckily. Actually, the other one, it's very, very similar. It, it swirls around, but it's almost as if it was meant to be a set. So class, that's our little jewelry lesson for today. I hope you've enjoyed this. Love to hear your comments. Let me know if the jewelry part interests you because I know we're all here for the knitting. I will be back in coming weeks with several different guests and I have some really like neat surprise guests in the works. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and make sure you select the bell that has the little lines next to it so that you get notified when I've come out with an episode, because I know you don't want to miss those interviews. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your knitting and stay safe. Bye.